Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Championing Individuality and Belonging Virtual Conference 2022. My name's Kerry Connor. I'm the Director of Organisational Development and Inclusion at University Hospital Southampton, UHS, and I'll be your host all day for today. I'll be helping navigate you in and out of all the sessions and, and um, introducing all the speakers. So we're so glad you joined us and we're planning to have a great day of amazing speakers, lots of interaction, some learning and a bit of fun, hopefully, and hopefully you'll stretch out of your comfort zone today. So you've come into this session from the lobby area where you can see and enter all of the sessions we're running today. We have some accessibility functions for you if you want to use them, the closed captions, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen in CC and British Sign Language will be available in, in Rosie Jones's session. Um, within each session like you're in now, there's a chat channel, please use it and we'll encourage you to use it during the day. And during each um, webinar, each session, there's a QA and a um, section at the bottom of your screen. And if you've got questions, please pop them in there. You can also pop your comments in the main lobby chat and everybody will be able to see that across the day. If you're having any technical difficulties, please pop them in the main lobby chat and one of the events team will help you and respond to you in there. So for now, let's get going. And I'd love to welcome David French, the UHS CEO, to open our event. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, um, th thank you, Kerry. And it, it's a, uh, a huge uh, pleasure to welcome you to uh, this, this conference today. And I'm just looking at the numbers. We've got more than, more than 100 people here. And I know we've got people from uh, UHS and we've also got people from outside UHS. And it's wonderful to have so many here. Uh, a couple of thank yous. Thank you so much to the organising uh, team for pulling this together. Um, and thank you to the external speakers who are giving their time today so generously. We've got a great lineup of speakers for the day, uh, and I know it's going to be a, an interesting and inspirational day. Uh, before I hand back to Kerry, just a couple of comments from me about why um, I think this is so important. I think everybody knows and recognises that better patient care happens when people feel like they belong. Better patient care happens when people feel that they're part of a team and part of a, of a family. And better patient care happens when people can be themselves and be who they want to be and be their best. Um, and better patient care is what we are all here to do. And that is why this is really simple. And this is why this is so important for us to, for today. So with that, Kerry, um, back to you uh, and everybody have a have a really great day thank you thank you so much David thank you for for opening our event today so before we start we want to see how confident you all feel um, at the start of the day and we're going to measure some of these topics as we go along um, and we'll ask you a couple of times so we're going to do our first one now so in the chat you'll see a link um, to uh, slido.com so if you press that, and you should be able to enter as a participant using the code hashtag 825, or you can use the uh, QR code on your screen to just take a couple of seconds to complete the poll. We'll do this again after lunch and in our last session together. And if you don't have time to do it right now, you can do it at any time um, during this morning's session. Um, but if you have a few minutes to do it right now, we'll, um, we'd really appreciate that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna get us going on the day. Um, I'd love to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Joan Myers OBE to the virtual stage. Hi, Joan. Morning. Welcome, thank you so much for, for coming this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm just gonna let you kick off um, and the screen is yours. Okay, I'm just going to put my slide, slides up and just thank you once again for inviting me along today. It's a great topic us to be talking about and I hope by the end of this you'll feel inspired, encouraged and you feel like you belong and that you're a part. I'm going to be talking about navigating my career um, in the NHS 
and just to let you know if I can do it, you can do it too. And I'm going to use these badges because I've got this thing about badges and um, it just helps to make it all flow. But before I start, I wanted to say about um, your organization, um, University Hospital of Southampton, when I let, read your people strategy, I thought it was absolutely amazing. So I've just put a few slides here. Our plan will support our greatest asset. And that's what I've always said, that, that nurses and healthcare workers are our greatest asset in the NHS. And I, I think it's a secret that nobody realizes that if you treat your people right, then the patients will be treated right, the service will be right, and everything will be brilliant. So I love this um, statement. It says, our plan will support our greatest asset, our people, to build a future for UHS where world-class people are able to deliver world-class care our patients deserve. And we look forward to working with you all. If I lived in Southampton, I mostly would apply for a job to come and work with you because that's just a really good um, quote, which I know is not just a quote, because I read your people strategy, which says world-class people strategy is about growing and deploying the workforce of today and the future, a thriving community delivering world-class patient care. I think it's just absolutely amazing. And I just love, I love this slide here, thrive, excel and belong. That's what would happen when you're working at UHL. They didn't pay me to say this. I read your people's strategy and I thought, fantastic. And the fact that it's actually in purple as well, my favorite color, I thought I had to just give that little plug there. But this is about me. But before I say that, I'll say this right at the beginning, because as I said, each and every one of us are an asset and sometimes we don't know it. So I'm gonna say this before I forget to say it at the end. This is for you, I'm speaking to you directly. You are one of the kind, right from his mind, you are a divine design. There's no one else like you on the face of this earth. You're not just one in a million, you're one in eight billion. You know, it's gone up to eight billion now, one in eight billion. You're here for a reason, just for a season, not for life, but while you have life, make sure you leave a legacy for life. And the only way to do that is to have a vision, a passion and a dream and to fulfill it to the best of your ability. So I hope you feel encouraged already. If you don't remember anything else, remember that you're one of a kind of divine design. So this is me. I'm really proud to say that at the age of three, my mother gave me a nurse's uniform as a Christmas present. And from that day, I decided I wanted to be a nurse. But at school, um, I was always being told off. I talked a lot. Isn't it funny? I get paid to talk now. But I was always interrupting the class. So I used to do my work really quick. And then I would get really bored. And then I just start talking to everybody or I start asking the teacher questions. And they usually didn't know the answers to the questions that I was asking. So I was told I was below O-level standard, like GCSEs, and incapable of writing an essay. And they advised my mom to let me leave school because I was wasting my time, her time, and their time. And they told me that I should just go and work in Sainsbury's. They were really nasty and horrible to me. But just because somebody says you can't, doesn't mean that you can. Can't, you can. You could do whatever you want to do. It's not up to anybody else, it's up to you, but you need to know that for yourself. So. I went and did my O-levels. I failed them first time, second time. And the third time I woke up and realized it's not up to anybody else, it's up to me. And I buckled under and I proved them all wrong. I did eight O-levels, then on to do my A-levels. Then I went on to do all my other courses. So if you saw my first slide, I think if I just go back to the first slide, if you see all those letters at the bottom of my name there, oops, it's just to let you know. I, my mum asked me, how many more letters do I need after my name? And I said, um, I need at least um, 26, because there's 26 letters in the alphabet. And she's, and somebody told me the other day, there's actually more than 26 letters there. So I can stop now, so I've stopped. <laughs> so if I can do it from somebody they said can't do it, then you can do it too. So I did my general training at Lewisham General Hospital in South London. And then I went on to specialize at Guy's. And Guy's, it was a very posh hospital in those days. I suppose it still is. Most nurses, they trained at St. Thomas's, where Florence Nightingale was, and then they went to Guy's to specialise. But I trained at Lewisham General, District General Hospital, and went to Guy's. So when I went to Guy's, they said, how did you get here? They said, we at Guy's don't like Lewisham nurses. And I said, well, I ain't a Lewisham nurse now, am I, mate? I'm a Guy's nurse. And I did my, uh, my paediatric course at Guy's, absolutely loved it. It was absolutely brilliant. And then I became a Christian. 
And I just wanted to go to church on Sundays, but the sister on the ward didn't like me. In those days, they didn't have flexible workers. If they didn't like you, they really treated you really bad and they didn't really like me because I, was, I think I was always disrupting everything. I don't know why I'd be asking questions and all the rest of it. And I used to work practically every single weekend. In those days, we did seven nights in a row, seven nights off, but early shift, late shift, couple of days off and then back on nights again. And I hardly ever had any weekends off. And I said to the sister on the ward, can I just have one Sunday a month to go to church? She goes, well, you should have thought about that before you came into nursing. You can't work nine to five, Monday to Friday as a nurse and have every weekend off. I said, I don't particularly want to. I just want to have Sunday once in a while and a couple of days off in the week to go to meetings. And she said, no. And then usually when they say no, I think about a way of how to get them to say yes. So I knew that she didn't like doing the off-duty rotor. So I asked her a couple of days later if I could do the off-duty. She goes, of course, Joan. I was the senior staff nurse on the ward. And for that off-duty, what I did, I went round the ward and I asked everybody, who will work on my Sunday and I'll work on your Friday or Saturday? So obviously everybody wants Friday night and Saturday night off to go out and stuff. And nobody minded working on a Sunday because it's usually a quiet day. So I had six Sundays off in a row. And then the sister found out. And she said, I told you, Joan, you cannot work Monday to Friday, nine to five as a nurse and have every weekend off. I said, I don't particularly want to, but I'm going to do that anyway. And it just so happened, I read an unpublished dissertation about working in the community. And I decided that I wanted to become a pediatric home care nurse. That's what they were called then. They're called um, community children's nurses now. And I said, that's what I want to do. So I wrote my job description from this unpublished dissertation. I wrote my job description. I sent it to the whole of the NHS, well, all the health authorities in London. And I didn't hear from anybody, but a friend told me she was working in Camberwell. And I thought, I don't remember writing to them. Let me phone them. And do you remember the yellow pages? I looked in the yellow pages, found their number, phoned up the HR department, and I basically said, I want to be a paediatric home care nurse. Have you got any vacancies? They said, we're not sh quite sure what you're talking about, but we were advertising something like that, but the closing date was yesterday. And I begged them on the phone. I said, please, just send me an application form. I promise I'll fill it in straight away and I'll send it back. And they said, yes. I think they said yes just to get rid of me. Um, so, But they didn't send it. Ten days later, if you don't know me, one of the other things about me is I like to be persistent, insistent and consistent. And when you get resistance, you will find assistance. So 10 days later, I phoned them up. I said, you promised me an application form. I'm still waiting for it. I know where you are. I'm coming to get it. And they go, OK, it's OK. We will send it. They sent it to me. No lie. Their job description was practically the spitting image of the job description that I'd written. And I wrote a job description. I was an F grade nurse then. Those days they had letters rather than numbers. So F grade would have been like a band six or seven, I think. I, I was an F grade nurse. I put nine to five, Monday to Friday, F grade nurse, pediatric home care nurse. And I wrote all these things about what I'd do. Their job description was a G grade, the next level up like 5,000 pounds more, nine to five, Monday to Friday, pediatric home care nurse. And I went for the interview for the job and I didn't have the essential criteria of being a district nurse or a health visitor. And I told them and they said, well, if you're not shortlisted, you won't hear from us. But they did. I did hear from them. I went to the interview and I didn't care about that's it. Don't worry about anybody else. Just worry about yourself. I made sure that I would that job was mine. As far as I was concerned, the job was mine. Went for the interview and they asked me all these questions. I answered all their questions and they said, what research have you read recently that's changed your views about nursing? And I said, pediatric home care team in the 1980s. And then when they asked me, have I got any questions? By the way, at an interview, when they ask you, have you got any questions? It's for you to ask them any questions about the organization to find out whether you want to work with them. But I didn't really know that. All I knew is that I wanted a job. So I just said, I don't have any questions, but I just want to let you know that I will take this job, but I'm only taking it on condition you pay for me to do my district nursing course I'll work for you for a year then you can send me off the course and then you can make me a G grade after that and they just looked at me and said we've got many applicants we'll let you know they did they phoned me up three days later offered me the job told me I could start in a month's time I said no 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 I need to start straight away I left my other job already I need to start I started on the Monday and the poor woman that was going to be my manager she took she just came back from annual leave she took one look at me she said the pediatric home care team starts today with you Get the patients, get the paperwork and tell everybody about it. 
And then I suddenly realized I didn't really have a clue about working in the community. But that doesn't matter because there's always people around you, near you, supporting you that will help you along the way. So the guy that wrote the unpublished dissertation, I got in contact with him and he became my mentor and he helped me out and I was able to become a um, paediatric home care nurse. And just to tell you, have determination, have resolve, be persistent, persevere, hold on to your goals. You will get there in the end. You just have to hold on. And just to show you all my qualifications, I'm not showing off, or maybe I am, I don't know. It's just to let you know, when they told me I couldn't do it, I made sure that I had a certificate for every single thing that I did. Because when I, when I qualified, I remember there was a black nursing officer and she was the only one at the time. She was really brilliant. She was always encouraging us. Where do you see yourself in the next three years time? What do you want to do next? And when they made all the changes in the NHS, she got demoted from being a nursing officer to being a band seven sister in outpatients in a completely different ever hospital. And when I saw that, I thought, nobody's going to do that to me. And the reason why she had worked her way up to the top but she hadn't got any certificates to prove it. And that's how it worked in those days. But because she was black as well, she, she, she didn't get away with it. Other people got away with it, but she didn't and they demoted her. So I made sure that I have a piece of paper and one of my greatest certificates, NVQ level four incompetent manager. I got that, when I got that, I took that certificate and put it on my wall in my office. I couldn't believe that I was really a manager, although I was managing, but I just didn't really realize it until I saw that piece of paper. And then when I got my, um, MSc in professional leadership in healthcare, I was just overwhelmed. I didn't even realize the impact of what people said to me. Sometimes we don't realize until years afterwards. The next day after I got my results, first thing I woke up in the morning and I thought, I've got my masters. And then I started crying and I was crying and I phoned my mom, I got my masters. And she goes, I know Joan, you told me, you told everybody, we all know you got your masters. You told us yesterday, I could, yeah, but they told me that I was incapable of writing the essay and I was below O level standard. So it just shows you all that was in my, I didn't know that all came to the forefront, but it's just because somebody says that you can't do it, doesn't mean you can't do it. You can do it, you have got it and you will get there. If I could get there, you can get there too. So there's me as a pediatric district nurse, because in those days there wasn't the community children's nursing team. So I did the um, district nursing course and then Every time I had an essay to write about a, 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 um, an old lady, an elderly or old people, I would write in the introduction to my assignments. Well, I'm a paediatric nurse, so I'm going to talk about it from a paediatric perspective. And this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'll just talk about what I wanted to talk about. So I became a paediatric district nurse. I was the first paediatric district nurse. I worked in this team, absolutely phenomenal team. I did the sickle cell course. Somebody did the HIV and AIDS course. Somebody did the asthma, oncology. I mean, it was a phenomenal team, absolutely brilliant team. I absolutely loved it. And guess what? That was on the 15th of October, 1990. And up until the 31st of August, 2019, I've worked nine to five, Monday to Friday with every single weekend. There you are. So these are all the different roles that I've had along the way. And the, the roles that I've actually underlined and put in bold are actually new roles that never even existed. So the first one, when I came in the community as a pediatric home care nurse, that team never even existed. That role never existed. It was a brand new role. And then when that role was disbanded, three years later, it was pump priming money. They'd read this unpublished dissertation and they employed me because I had read it and they wondered how I got a copy of it. And they gave me the job, even though I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I soon learned pretty fast. Um, and when the team was disbanded three years later, um, Westminster got in contact with me and asked me to set up the community children's nursing team in West Lambeth. So I set up in West Lambeth. And then in 2003, I became the first and only nurse consultant for community children's nursing in the whole of the UK. So that was absolutely amazing. Then I became a nurse consultant for children and young people. That was a completely new role. And my last role before I retired from the NHS, as Associate Director for Health Service and Chief Nurse, was in Achievement for Children, which was a community interest company of health, education and social care. And I was the chief nurse there. So if I can do it, you can do it too. And one of my greatest pride is setting up a nurse-led eczema clinic in the community. It was the first time they had a, a community eczema clinic. And I had challenges. There was this dermatologist. He said, "Who's what's a nurse consultant anyway? And who's that Joan Myers? And how could she set up an eczema clinic? She hasn't got a dermatology course. I said, I don't need to have a dermatology course to set up an eczema clinic. 
And so thankfully I had support of other people and I was able to set up this clinic and the clinic still, it was one, it's been running since 2006 and it's still running today because when I set it up, I trained other people to work in the team as well. So that when I moved on, they were able to continue. And I was able to be an advisor on the BNF for children because I did my nurse, but it was one of the first pediatric nurses at that time to do um, nurse prescribing course. But for me, being on the um, panel for the NICE guidance for children with eczema under the age of 12, um, I was on this panel. I was the only black person there. I was the only community person there. They were mainly from tertiary hospital, pediatricians, dermatologists, and specialist nurses from Great Woman Street and everything. But I was the only black person and the only person working in the community. And I said, did you know that black skin is different to white skin? And they all looked at me like, yeah, whatever, we all know that. I said, well, why don't you talk about it then? Because black skin presents differently, therefore you misdiagnose them. So often you're diagnosing the baby with ringworms and scabies and stuff when it's actually eczema because it presents differently. And I said, also, our skin doesn't like the white cream because we've got really thickened skin. We like oily cream, like sheer butter, cocoa butter, coconut oil. That's the kind of cream that black skin likes because it's completely different in, the, in its structure to white skin. And because I said that, if you look at the NICE guidance for children with eczema under the age of 12, they've actually got a box that says children from Asia, Africa or the Caribbean may present differently. And they actually know now the GPs and everybody knows now to think differently when they're looking at children with eczema that have dark, darkly pigmented skin. So that's the transformation and change that you can have by being in the right space. And that's why I always advocate that you have to have diversity of thought and different people around the panel. If you're at a, pad, if you're at a meeting, a panel, a committee, a board meeting, and everybody looks exactly the same, you're gonna have group think. If you're all the same, thinking the same, you have to have somebody that thinks outside the box. And often you need to have diversity, not just because they've got a different skin color, but different culture, different ways of thinking and ways of doing. Have them around the table and you'll have new, fresh, innovative ideas that would improve things. Okay, I better move really fast. This is one of my pride and joy as well. In 2004, I found out about Mary Seacole for the first time. To think I was a nurse from 1985 and I only found out about it in 2004. And I said, if Mary Seacole could be excavated from obscurity and put in a place of prominence, then there's hope for black and minority ethnic nurses as well. And when this picture on the left was found, this is the original portrait picture photo of uh, Mary Seacole. I showed it to my mum, it's on the postcard. It was found in Winchester College. And I've got a postcard of it and I showed it to my mum and my mum said it looks like her great grandmother. So I always tell people there's a possibility that Mary Seco could be related to me. I don't know. Anyway, I became an ambassador for the Mary Seco statue pill and I was selling these badges. Some of you may have one of these badges, they're collector's items now. And I would go everywhere and I'll sell these badges to people. And Dame Elizabeth and you on you just say, Joan, stop badgering the people. I said, no, they need to have a badge and the badge is only like a pound. And one year I was an advisor for the Chief Nurse Officer for England. So she allowed me to speak for five minutes at the CNO Summit. And I was supposed to speak about something, but I just speak about, you know, you hear what I'm speaking about. And I just said, um, I just got these badges. They own, I said, I'll sell them for just two pounds if you let me sing a song. And I said, it takes two, baby, like that. And all these directors of nurses all queued up and bought badges for two pounds. And then I got in contact with Lord Clive Soley. And I said, can we have a tea talk and um, tour of the Palace of Westminster and I'll charge people 50 pounds to come along and all the money will go to Mary Seacole. And he goes, will people come along? I goes, of course they would. I goes, lots of friends, they will come along. And we had 58 people, we had to have two sittings of people. People couldn't believe it. I'd welcomed them to the House of Lords. Welcome to my humble abode. And they'd be there eating afternoon tea and stuff. How do you do this, Jenna? I goes, if you don't ask, you don't care. And so we raised quite a lot of money. So it was really wonderful in 2016 when the statue of Mary Seco went up. I, kept, I don't know if you've seen it. It's in the grounds of St. Thomas's Hospital. And every opportunity I used to go there and just have a look at it. And my mom said, say, stop idolizing it. It's just a statue. I go, no, it means so much. It's one of the first statues to a named black person in the UK. And in 20, um, was it 2014? Alan Titchmarsh came and did my garden. So if you thought you recognised my face, you might have seen me on TV because they keep putting it on. But the amazing thing was the Queen's Nurses Institute um, gave me this outstanding service award. 
And I always thought I was a Queen's nurse, but I wasn't. <laughs> I just had, it, on my district nursing badge, it had Queen's Nurse Institute on it, but I wasn't a Queen's nurse. I had to apply to be a Queen's nurse. So anybody here that's a community nurse, whether you're a district nurse, community children's nurse, health visitor, school nurse, practice nurse, if you've been working in the community, you're doing phenomenal, great work, then make sure you apply to become a Queen's nurse because it's a great institution to be a part of. And it was over 2000 people were nominated to have their garden done. And I was, they voted for me to have my garden done. And I was just doing a talk about Mary Seacole that was being filmed for TV. And Alan Titchmarch walked in the room while I was talking. And I'm looking at this man as he walks in, I'm looking at him and I'm thinking that man is very important. Actually, he's very famous. My God. It's Alan Titchmarsh. By the time he got up to me, I recognised who he was. And he said, we've heard about the lovely work you've been doing. We'd love to do your garden. I said, yeah, but you just interrupted my talk, so you need to buy a badge. And he did. He bought a Mary Seco badge, and he actually wore it on the programme as well. And he put up a website for, to raise funds for Mary Seco as well. He's an absolutely lovely guy. And that, that, was, that picture of my garden was taken. The garden was done in 2014, and that's what my garden looked like this summer. It looks absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. And he said, why should we do your garden? Because my garden was a state. I said, I ain't got time for watering plants and digging up weeds and stuff like that. I said, just give me some eco deckings and a big um, barbecue table and a prayer house at the bottom of my garden. And he said, what do you want a prayer house for? I said, I want to get up in the morning, pray and prepare for work. And he goes, a garden for prayer and meditation. So he gave me this absolutely beautiful garden. And here, I'm really, really happy to know, to tell you that when I became an nurse consultant, I had to have my master's. And then they told me that I need to do my PhD because I've raised the bar. I said, I don't want to do my PhD. They said, no, yes, you do, Joan, because you're setting the example to everybody else. I said, I'm not doing it. And they were, and they do this pincer movement. They come from all angles, the director and the clinical manager. And they were telling me that I had to do my PhD. And one day I said, OK, I'll do my PhD. And they were all happy. I said, I'm going to do it in um, biblical studies. And then from that day, they never asked me again. But thankfully, Middlesex University got in contact with me one year and they asked me, they just told me they wanted to give me an honorary doctorate. So that's why I've got a doctor in front of my name. So it's not a taught doctorate, but it's from life experience. And what was really great about that is I used to teach there and they never, ever paid me. When I taught at South Bank or Hertfordshire or wherever, they, ever, they always paid me, but Middlesex never did. And one day I said, how come you don't pay me when I come and lecture? They said, because you've never asked this. What a cheat. I said, well, I do want to get paid. They said, you can't ask after the effect. The effect. I goes, okay. So the next time they asked me, I said, well, you need to pay me first. And they goes, we thought you'd do it pro bono. I said, well, pro bono don't pay my mortgage. Are you working for pro bono? And they said, no. And they said, we really, I said, no, no. If you want me, you have to pay or I'm not coming. But no, we really need you. I said, tell your manager then. So they wrote and said they wanted me. And then they got me and they, they videoed me and they never asked me back again. But 10 years later, they gave me the honorary doctorate. So I let them off. <laughs> and just to let you know, you, if you, you need to let everybody know the great work that you're doing. As I said, all of you are absolutely fantastic. You're doing great stuff, but sometimes you don't recognize it because it's just your day job. I wrote an article because if for the nursing times because they said they'll pay me 75 pounds if I wrote a little bit about myself. So I wrote a little bit about myself, 650 words, and they paid me 75 pounds. I thought it was fantastic. It's a lot of money in those days. And then they interviewed me and then I saw myself, my name in lights. And then from that day, I decided I'm going to write an article every year. So I have. I've written one every single year. I've actually even written one this year. It's just I haven't put it on there yet. But I have every single year I write an article about something that I've done or something about nursing, something to actually encourage. You're doing stuff that sometimes you don't realise is really, really good that somebody needs to know about. So write your articles, go to conferences, tell people what you're doing. Nearly finished. The struggle you're in today is developing that you strength the need you need for tomorrow. It's not easy going. I did, you did go through a lot of challenges, but you know, you have to be, you have to have self-belief and self-confidence. And when you have self-worth, you won't allow anybody or anything to put you down. And if it, if it does, find a coach or a mentor that will help you. And this is just to show you some of the awards I've got. I mean, I, I don't even know why they gave me all these awards, but one of my great one was the best one. Well, one of them, they're all brilliant. Was the Zenith Global Health Award in 2018, because I do um, medical missions in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, wherever, wherever, um, in Uganda, it's absolutely brilliant. My, I've got a charity in Kenya, so I do one over there most years, but that's what I've got that award for, the Zenith Global Health Award, but yeah. And then scholarships, really important. There's all these scholarships available for nurses and healthcare workers. You could do fellowships, scholarships, 
I did the Florence Nightingale Scholarship. It's like an open, it's like a key opener. It opens all these doors for all these things and access to support and help and stuff. And I, I, was, I didn't do a Mary Seacole Award, but I was on the review panel when they were actually deciding whether to keep it or whether to let it go. Thankfully, the Mary Seacole Awards are still continuing and they're actually managed by the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And it's funny because I used to work for the Department of Health reviewing the Mary Seacole Awards. And when I applied for the Florence Nightingale Scholarship, they asked me, why did I want to do a Florence Nightingale Scholarship? And I said, well, I've been there, done that, got the hat to prove it for Mary Seacole. So now it's Florence Nightingale's turn. <laughs> and this is for you. Whatever you do, be enthusiastic, passionate and fervent. Excel in your area of experience and expertise. Have a personal development plan or the five P's, proper preparation prevents poor performance. When you have obstacles, obstructions and oppositions, see them as opportunities and ask yourself, what opportunity do I have to optimistically overcome my obstacles? See the windows of opportunities and go through the open doors. Be self-aware, self-disciplined and self-managed. It's all about being emotional intelligent. And utilize what you've got, where you are, till you get where you need to go. Because often we're crying and murmuring and complaining about where we are, our managers, our colleagues and everybody else, when you're actually where you are because you need to be where you are. Learn and glean all that you can from the people that you're with and around and they can support you and help you along the way. And even the people that are treating you really badly, you can learn about how not to behave and how to deal with different situation have a role role model or relevant mentor or coach I do coaching and mentoring and I'm amazed at the amount of nurses and healthcare workers that I see that are absolutely phenomenal but they don't believe it because nobody's ever really told them and they just need somebody just to show them how brilliant they are and and just put it before their faces and help them so when I do interview preps 98 percent of the people that I prepare for interviews get their jobs and I always say Go where you're celebrated, don't stay where you're tolerated. Anytime you're denigrated, you will never be appreciated. And many, especially for black and minority ethnic nurses, many of them are stuck at band fives and sixes at that level for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. And I always say, it's not their fault often, it's usually their manager's fault. Because if you're a leader and a manager and you've got somebody working in your team for 10 years at exactly the same level, what kind of leadership and development and support are you doing to providing for that person to be maintaining it at that level? And also that person that stayed at that level for 10 years, they're no longer a band five, they're mostly a band seven because you're mostly utilizing them as a band seven because they're, they're able to do the work. And I often say, apply for a job two bands higher than where you are and look at the person's spec. And if you can do at least 70% of the stuff on the person's spec, apply for the job and you will get it. And I, somebody came to me, they were a band eight at B, going for a band A D job and their manager told them that they're not ready for it yet. So somebody said, go and see Joe. And they came to see me and I said, it's not up to your manager to decide whether you're ready. It's up to you whether you're ready or not. Are you ready? And after I finished preparing for his um, interview, I didn't do much preparing. It's just talk, talking him through and never let him see who he is. He applied for the job and he's now at 8D and he's absolutely phenomenal and he's doing absolutely well. And last but not least, exposure. Let your light shine. When you go to meetings, don't sit there in a meeting saying nothing. You're in the meeting for a reason. Read the agenda, get to know what, the, what they're talking about and have something to say, something to contribute and stop waiting for somebody else to say it. And then when somebody else says it now, you think, oh my gosh, I should have said it. Just say it. Just say what needs to be said. So go to conferences, go to meetings, speak up, write articles, make sure that you're out there. It's not because I'm brilliant that, I, that you know about me, it's because I make sure that people know about me because I talk a lot and then they pay me to talk. <laughs> um, and that's my, I, that was my last um, badge that I got, the Queen's Nurses, Fellowship, Queen's Nurses Institute. I became a fellow of the Queen's Nurses Institute in December last year. And in 2015, um, David Cameron wrote me this letter to tell me that he'd like to present my name to the Queen to give me become an officer of the British Empire for services to children and nurses. I couldn't even believe it. Even when I got it, I still didn't believe it. I kept thinking that I was going to get a letter saying it was the wrong Joan Myers and it was somebody else. I didn't believe it for a long time. But then when I started getting all these people phoning me, writing to me, inviting me to places, I mean, the, the mayor invited me for afternoon tea at the town hall. And then Prince Charles invited me to St. James Palace for an evening reception. Then I went to Buckingham Palace and Prince William's. It was the first time that he did the 
the, the um, investor share. And it's, it's very pleasing to look at. It looks very nice. And I held on to his hand. I wouldn't let go of his hand the whole time he was talking to me. And he, but he was a very, very lovely person. But my head was swelling and swelling because everybody kept telling me how brilliant and wonderful I am. So I left the country and I went to Kenya for four weeks. I've got a charity in Kenya and I stayed in the slum area with the children. I've got 25 children that are sponsored to go to school and stuff and, and feed them and everything. And they kept going, oh, TGI, what is the OBE? What is the OBE? I said, the OBE means overflowing blessings every day so I want you all to know that you've all got overflowing blessings every day and this is my greatest legacy this is Sharon this is just on the left this little girl here even though she looks don't she look like me from the I met her when she was three years old in this slum area in the market square in Kenya and I was preaching and telling everybody how much God loved them Jesus loved them everybody loves them and I just heard this voice saying Everybody knows Jesus, God, and you love them. Demonstrate my love in action. Bless that little girl. And by blessing her, all the children in the village would be blessed. That was in 2002. I sponsored her to go to school. She's now 23. When she was 18, she told me that I was her greatest role model and she wants to be like me. And she's just finishing, she took her last semester, finishing her nurse training. She phoned me the other day to tell me she got 80% in her assessment. And she, she, she's doing her general nursing in Kenya, they do mid nursing and midwifery and everything all mixed together. She was doing episiotomies as a Bantu, as a, a um, year two student, putting in cannulas. And last week she phoned me to tell me that she was a scrub nurse and that she actually cut the umbilical cord. And she's just a third year student nurse. I mean, over there, they're just well trained. And that's another thing. This country has a lot to answer for. We're bringing in all these international um, nurses, some of them are just amazing. They're doing stuff way above what any of us will be allowed to do over here. And they're really good at what they do. And then they get put down to a band four and a band five and stuck at that level and get de-skilled and not really recognized for the work that they do. Recognize the staff you've got, value them for what they do. I do a training and development at a couple of NHS hospitals in London. And there was a band three nurse working as an assistant, whatever. And I was listening to the work that he was doing and what he was I said, he's absolutely amazing. And I spoke to the HR director. I said, you better do something about this guy because he's going to be snapped by somebody straight soon when they hear about him. He went from a band three to a band seven. When they interviewed him and found out the skills and the competencies he got, he did a QI project that demonstrated that he was absolutely brilliant and he shouldn't be a band three. He's now a band seven. So look at those internationally recruited nurses that you've got. Recognize, we talk about belonging, individuality and diversity. Grab those great assets that you've got and use them to the best of your ability for the benefit of not only the organization but and the nurse, but also the, the patient at large. And that's me on the top of Table Mountain in South Africa. I did not know I was on the edge like that. Be on the edge. Live your life. You've only got one life. Live in the moment. Make the most of it. Don't let anybody put you down. Know who you are. Be who you are. Arise, ascend, and advance to the next level because you're absolutely phenomenal. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, Joan. Uh, that's all I can say is wow. I mean, that was an amazing talk. Um, so inspirational. You've got so much love in the chat. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm going to have to take the role of trying to sum up everybody's love for you in the chat. Thank you. Um, so awesome, inspiring, huge love. Be, hashtag be like Joan was one of my <laughs> favourite ones. Uh, wow. Um, no, so thank you so much. Everybody has absolutely loved your session. Um, so I've got nine questions in the <laughs> chat, um, which we might not have time to get through, but um, some of them are of a similar vein. So um, we'll see how we go. Um, so uh, Bijal, so Bijal has said, when you get knocked down countless times, how do you keep your chin up and, and get the strength to, to keep going and, and walk through? Uh, don't worry, I've been knocked down lots of times, but when you're knocked down, you have to get back up again, isn't it? And I, I, have, a, I have lots of coaches and mentors and I phone them up and I say, guess what my manager said or guess what she did or guess what they did? And then I'll be moaning and groaning and they'll be saying, okay, so just calm down. Let's take the emotion out of it all and let's see if there's any element of truth in it. Because sometimes it's, when you get feedback, there is some truth in it. It's just that we don't want to accept the truth. We just latch on the bit that we know that's not true. And so we just assess it all and then I learn from it and then pick myself up and say, that's not going to happen again. Or this what I'm going to this I'm going to deal with it the next time. Yeah. Okay. Always look at it as, as something where you can learn a little bit more about yourself and help you to get to the next level. Fantastic. 
And then somebody else has put, what can you do to build up your confidence to, to speak up and to be, to be able to do all the things that you've said in, in your talk? Uh, one of the really simple things is your name, whatever your name is, think of a word that describes who you are. So your name is Kerry. Kerry. Hmm. So C, you're compassionate. E, you're enthusiastic. R, you're resilient. And I, you're inspirational. I just made it up. But if you look at Did your name. Did someone take that down? <laughs> <laughs> if you look at your name and then think of all the things that describes who you are and then be that every day. And I had somebody that I was, she was going for a BSM level. She was a band 8C and she was going for a BSM level. And she got it because her name was Philomena. And I got her to write it for her whole name. And she was able to say that she was passionate. She was a professional. Amazing. She was hardworking. She was an inspirational leader. She did all that. And by the time she finished that, within two days of her just saying that to herself, it built up her confidence and her resilience in herself to believe that she can and she will. And she did. And she's doing phenomenal. Brilliant. So you can do it too. You, you had so many different um, sort of uh, quotes and acronyms. And I mean, how do you come up with all that stuff? I mean, is it just natural? Is it a natural I, I, I think I just thing? make them up as I go along and sometimes <laughs> I write them down. In, in Kenya, the children in Kenya, they go, Auntie Jane, you're always saying these nice things. Why don't you write a book? And I said, I would like to write a book, but I haven't got time for that. They go, no, no, just tell us. And I, I just wrote down 15 quotes and they made this little, little, little this is when I prepared earlier, ah. little, little weedy pocketbook. And they goes, what are we going to call it? And I just said, wise inspirational sayings every day. And I didn't realise it actually spells wise. <laughs> but there's not hardly any left now. They're all practically sold out because I bought them. When I came back from Kenya and Abel, I put them in my suitcase <laughs> and they all got sold. They all just went, I'm not surprised. went back to the money for the charity. Yeah, <laughs> Amazing. So Emma says, how do you respond when people are trying to quieten your voice on things that you're passionate about? Oh, I was just told, be told to calm down and take the emotion out of it. And all this tone policing, they want to tell us what to say, how to say it. I said, no, no, I'm a human being. This is the way I feel. I'm not shouting. I'm not aggressive. I'm not the angry black woman. I'm just telling you passionately how I think and how I feel. So I think we should just be who we are. And because we've got such diversity, we've got multicultural people, all different kinds of people. We need to understand that different people speak in different ways so we shouldn't be putting them down we should be to go beyond the emotion and everything and say why are they speaking like that just the way if a, a patient was angry and shouting you wouldn't shut them up you'd actually just have to stop and listen and hear what they're having to say and that's what we need to do with each other because we're all individual and all different mm -hmm. I might be raising my voice and saying something but you might be able to say exactly the same thing in a calm kind of way because your experiences are different to my experiences. So we need to realize that. I remember somebody saying, somebody going, calm down. We haven't got acts to grind. And the person was getting more and more inflamed and angry. And what they didn't realize by saying, I haven't got acts to grind, which is an English saying, this person came from Africa where they seen people in their villages being chopped up and all sorts of stuff. And we said, we haven't got acts to grind. It was making them even more angry and inflamed and they didn't realize mm. that. So we need to be really careful. Yeah. And when you have come across um, discrimination or, or, you know, anything that's trying to stop you, how, how do you personally, well, in the moment, how do you tend to respond? What are the, what are the things or tips you might be able to give people to, to respond in the moment when they come across that kind of stuff? Well, for me, I deal with it head on because thankfully I could just deal with it head on. But often it's a bit challenging and difficult, depending on who the person is and where it happens. I would always say, take the person aside and tell them exactly what they said and how it made you feel. I remember somebody was making this joke and laughing at me. I've got dyslexia of direction, so I'm always getting lost as a community nurse. They go, Joe's taking the car again, and then we only have to go 10 minutes up the road. You can walk there. She said, well, we're going to take three hours, and they were laughing and joking. And the, I was not laughing. I wasn't impressed, actually. And the next day, I called her in my office, and I said, don't don't speak to me like that I said it's disrespectful and you're undermining me in the presence of my staff don't do it again and she started crying I thought what are you crying for I handed her one hanky I said don't do it again she goes I'm really sorry I was only joking I said was I joking I wasn't laughing I didn't find it funny just don't do it again and I don't know what you're crying for don't do it again I accept your apology and then that was it left the room and after that, she's fixed up and sorted herself out and everything was absolutely fine. So I always say hit it on the head. Never wait for people to treat you badly one, two, three, four, five, six times. 
first time you let them off, think oh, it's just maybe a problem with them. Second time, after the third time at the max, take them aside and ask them, I need to understand why you said what you said or what, what did you mean by that? And what can we do going forward? But find somebody to support you as well, because it depends on who the person is. Mm -hmm. OK, so Andy says, if you could give the 20 year old Joan one piece of advice, what would it be and how could they make it stick? Oh, my gosh, the 20 year old Joan. I don't know. Um, I suppose the same thing that I say to myself now, I just be who I am. I've, I've always just been who I am. I've always got told off for just um, I, I was too familiar with the senior staff. I just think everybody's exactly the same. Like when I met Prince Charles, I said, can we have a picture together, please? He goes, of course. And I'm there getting a the picture with him. And then one of these people came across and pushed me out of the way. I said, you can't do that. You can't have, I said, but he didn't mind, sort of thing. And I, I was, everybody's a human being. Treat everybody with love and compassion. And everybody needs attention. Everybody needs love. We're all very special. Even the very difficult, challenging people just be that much nicer to them because they need it. So when they're really, really horrible, I just killed them with killed them with love, I say. <laughs> I just did that <laughs> with one of the managers, she really hated me. I knew she hated me. So every time she came to see me, I had to offer a cup of coffee. No, it's okay, because the kettle is on and I've also bought your favourite biscuits. So she had no choice. And in the end, she just got used to me. And then we got Killing with kindness is a tactic. Yeah, killing with kindness. <laughs> <laughs> and you talked about diversity of thought during your, your session. Um, Obviously, the, the whole day today is about individuality, diversity. Um, how can we in the NHS get better at encouraging that diversity as a strength? I think we need to look at the staff that we've got. We've got the NHS has got a wealth of people in the organisation. I said to Dame Ruth May that it shouldn't be called the National Health Service. It should be called the International Health Service because we have an international workforce and we also have international Patients, everybody's from different cultures, backgrounds and everything. Learn from them. We've got, we've got people right on our doorstep. You can learn from the nurses that come from India, Philippines, what about their culture, who they are, what they like, what they do. We can learn from each other and have those cultural days where you have, everybody likes food. So jellof rice, if you come from you get Nigerian food and the Ghanaian food, they're always arguing about jellof rice, um, whatever get the food together, the jerk chicken and eat it and, and get to find out about each other's culture, get everybody to wear their cultural wear one day at work. Then like you have Mufti day, you can have a cultural day. Where every, I, was, um, I took my mom to a hospital locally the other day and I saw an Italian doctor, a Sikh doctor, a Greek doctor, Filipino nurses and a Barbadian nurse. And I said, you should have our name, like, hello, my name is Joan. And then underneath it can have where you're from. They're like when you go on a cruise and it says, yeah, yeah. But then you could ask the people about their country and just yeah. say it in a nice kind of way rather than where are you from? What do you mean by where you, where am I from? I was from here. I was born here. But if it says my name's Joan, I was born in London, then there you are. <laughs> and then we get we just do something. So small changes. Yeah, small yeah. changes. Um, so so Liz has said, um, what's next for you after all that career? You know, what's <laughs> next on the agenda for you? Well, I am. Um, I retired from the NHS in 2019. I know I'm very young, I'm younger than that. But I anyway, I left the NHS and I set up my company. So I do coaching and mentoring, training and development. So a couple of NHS organisations asked me to come in. I've done talent and leadership management programmes from band twos all the way up to band eight Bs. And 28% of them got promoted in the first five months of doing right. the programme. These are people who've been stuck at one level. Yeah. But when you understand about who you are, understanding self, and having self-belief and knowing how to navigate the system and then demonstrating that your organization needs you and that you're important in the organization then things turn around and things change so I love it and I love mentoring I love coaching I love inspiring and empowering so yeah that's well you I do it do. brilliantly so you should you should carry on mm -hmm. um we've got a couple of people in the chat talking about kind of the wider MDT team so you know not just your clinical teams but your admin and your support staff you know how have you felt um you know working in those wider teams and, and the kind of contribution everybody can make well everyone every single health that's why I say healthcare worker rather than just nurses I know I've talked about myself as a nurse but everyone is vitally important especially the admin team because they undergird and they support and hold up the whole system. And so we need them. And I think if we, I, I, I was read somewhere, somebody said, we don't actually need to strike. 
We just need to work within our space. So if nurses did what nurses did and allowed the admin people to do all the administration side and the physios to do their the OT, and if everybody did their little bit in their space, and then we did, so if I could just home in to what I do really well, like I talk well, so I just home into talking, talking really, really well, then I could do that really well. And then you're really good at writing reports. So you could write the reports and then somebody else will be really good at doing something practical. And so you get, find that there's a unique skill and ability of everybody and utilize it and don't give them all these band one, band two, band five. Oh, I'm only a band five, I'm only a band six. We should not be describing people like that. They are nurses or admin workers, or physios or OTs. We need to speak to them as who they are as professionals. And it is true, we are very into titles. I remember speaking to this consultant about one of my children on the ward. And I said, the mother was complaining about the child. I said, I'm the community nurse. And the mother said this, this and this. Then he sort of looked down his nose at me. And then I said, as a nurse consultant for community children, nurse, and I think it's really important that we do this, this and this. And he suddenly fixed up. He said, oh, I need to speak to you. You're the nurse consultant. Come and see me in my office. And his tone and his whole demeanor and the way he treated me completely changed from me saying that I'm a community nurse to saying that I'm the nurse consultant. We should, we need to stop doing that and value everybody's experience and expertise and what they bring to the table, regardless of what their labels and titles are. Absolutely agree. I, I always, I, a lot of us talk about, why do we always talk about people by their pay bands? It's just mm. crazy, isn't it? You wouldn't find that anywhere else. No. Um, and then the last one, I think probably we've got time for, um, what is your advice for building personal resilience? Well, I'm a woman of faith. If you haven't noticed that already, my faith in God, I could just talk to God and you just tell me. But if the creator tells you that you're fantastic, then you must be fantastic because he must know because he made you. But being also around people that believe in you and encourage you and actually tell you when you're wrong, because my friends are not afraid to tell me, so Jones, sit down and calm down. You're getting a bit tired away now. Or to keep your feet on the ground. Like my mum was just saying, don't keep your foot on the ground. <laughs> It's head too big. <laughs> my mum would call me back down to the calm again. I remember when I got my nurse consultant job, she said, why you want to get a job like that? Why do I want to get a job like that? She goes, they're going to stress you out and I have to pray for you. So that she, they're going to stress me out and she's going to have to pray for me. <laughs> so my mum is my biggest role model, my biggest mentor and coach. She keeps me grounded. Even when I got the OBE. I don't think she was that bothered about it, OB, until she was going into the gates of Buckingham. I was going to say, did she go with you? Yeah, when she was yeah. going into, oh, this is so lovely. And, and she got to sit at the front because she was in a wheelchair. Right. And so she was at the front. She saw everything. And she had a soldier in a red suit that wheeled her around. And she loved it, absolutely loved it. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> so is there anything final? Is there any final words you want to say before we before we close? Final words to everyone, you're all important, you're all special. I said my bit at the beginning, if I didn't hear it before, you're one of a kind, a divine design. There's no one else like you. You're not just one in a million, you're one in eight billion. Could you imagine that? You're absolutely unique and special. Find what you're good at, fulfill it, and then you will, fulfill, and then you will be fulfilled. And arise and ascend and advance and get to the next level and let nobody and nothing can no one stop you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, amazing advice thank you so much i can't thank you enough and on behalf of everybody that's here got 133 people on at the moment wow. um thank you so much for for starting off our conference in such an amazing way um and yeah brilliant thank you so much thank you and all the best to you too thank you thanks jane wow how do we follow that hey um so one thing I, before we go for a quick break so we can get our breath back um i'd like to just speak to you about is a little functionality that we've got um, keeping our day interactive called Real Talk. So Real Talk is um, somewhere that you can just go on anonymously. You can put your thoughts down there. You can put maybe some questions you might want to ask but are too afraid to say out loud, somewhere where you can just put some reflections. Um, and it's just a safe space for you to go on and, and, and sort of uh, get out what you're thinking and saying. So if you go into slido.com or through the QR code, hashtag 123, you can go in there and other people will see it, but it will be anonymous. So they won't know that it's from you. Um, so I really encourage you to use that. And often 
with these sessions, you, you kind of have those thoughts going around in your mind that you just want to get out somewhere. So Real Talk is the place to do that. So if you can um, do that during the day, we'll keep on reminding you um, that that's the place to go and kind of empty your, empty your thinking and, and um, maybe ask some questions that, that you might want, not want to ask out loud. So, wow, I'm exhausted already. Um, thank you so much for all your chat questions and your, and your chat comments. Um, so we're gonna just break now for, uh, I think we're back in the lobby. Um, that's the place you need to go. Uh, and then the next session will start at 10.25 and then you'll go into that session um, as you did come into this session. So um, thank you so much and I'll see you shortly. <laughs>